All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Rusty Mahalik. I'm the convener of ACRL's leadership discussion group. Um, I'm very pleased, excited to have Alex and Carly, who I hope I pronounced his last name correctly, in Arujan Zami, present People, Programs, and Personality, Striking a Balance in Library-Led Justice-Oriented Initiatives. And I'm going to pass the mic off to them, and it's going to be a great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Hello, and thank you, uh, Rusty, for bringing us all together. My name is Aruj Nizami, and I'm the Community Engagement and Outreach Librarian for the Public Knowledge Project, best known as the Home of Open Journal Systems, or OJS, at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. Before this role, I worked more squarely in open education to support open education resource publishing and open pedagogy work. Both of these things we'll get into um, just in a bit. Um, I've also managed zero textbook cost programs, which are a collection of courses that do not require students to purchase a textbook. These courses are labeled as such oftentimes in a course catalog to increase transparency around the often hidden costs of textbooks. More recently, I've become more interested in bibliodiversity and focusing on non-Western epistemologies as a challenge to normative and dominant ways of thinking and knowledge production. And I'm Alex and Kelly. So uh, I work for a nonprofit in Quebec, uh, which is called Collecto. Uh, and uh, we cover the whole um, college network in Quebec, which is a very specific thing, a little bit like community colleges. I see some people from community colleges. Uh, and it's a specific program that only exists in Quebec, uh, which is between high school and university in a way, uh, but it can also be technical pro programs. And we also work with universities uh, and even with school boards and things like that. A lot of my work personally is about open education. And uh, I come from a background of anthropology. I was trained as an anthropologist and I taught uh, for 20 years at nine different universities in three states and three provinces. Uh, so Massachusetts, Texas, Indiana, New Brunswick, uh, Ontario, and Quebec. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm kind of proud of that because it's about the diversity of uh, approaches to learning. So I'm mostly a learning professional and uh, I'm not a librarian, but I would qualify myself as an ally to uh, librarians. What I tend to say all the time is that librarians are the heroines and heroes of the information age. And certainly when we talk about open education, and uh, open knowledge, open access, open textbooks, open data, uh, open science, all of these things together certainly have a lot to do with what you do as librarians and what you do in libraries in general. Uh, so I think uh, we, we have a lot to say about what we do and how we do it, but also we can say a little bit about where we do it. So uh, I do acknowledge that I uh, reside uh, in the unceded territory of the uh, uh, Ganangahaga people, also known as Mohawk in some contexts. And uh, so it's specifically in the city of Jojage, also known as Montreal uh, by settlers. Uh, I was born here. I was uh, raised in the island that you see just uh, on top of it, uh, uh, just north of uh, the island of Jovage, uh, which is a place where it was a meeting ground for a number of nations. Uh, and to this day, like we, we keep talking about the traditional territory, but it's also the land that they still occupy in so many ways. And we we care deeply about this. There, there, there's something about the land where we live that informs our approach to knowledge. And certainly when we talk, we'll, I'll mention this concept a little bit uh, later on, but I, I, I think a lot about uh, a philosophical concept, which is epistemic justice. And uh, that to me is extremely important that there are many ways to know. And in terms of knowledge, like there's uh, a lot to be done in terms of where we reside and uh, how we uh, take advantage, uh, benefit from the land and uh, what we do with it and how we care for it. And I'm in the lower mainland of British Columbia and its unceded Coast Salish territory. Seeing that land acknowledgements are becoming more common, we want to highlight that they are insufficient. 
it's important to dive deeper, inform ourselves, particularly around calls from indigenous communities like land back. And this means for deep reflection, confronting possible discomforts and uneasiness. And I want to underscore that the lands where I work and live are unceded, um, same as Alex. As Alex, And what this means is that First Nations people never ceded or legally signed away their lands to, to the Crown or to Canada in our context. And would like us like to to uh, to reflect at some point during our session together. So uh, for your own, uh, we would like you to pause uh, for forty five seconds to reflect on you know a question at a time. And in this case, to reflect it, and it can be through doodles or whatever you do. It's for your own good, and you can refer back to to that later on. It's a little bit like a, an introvert friendly activity, and I know that some librarians might uh, uh, might work through that. So to reflect in this case about how decolonization can be applied to your institution. Can, can it be an issue? I was talking with someone, in, even in Switzerland, they, they think about that over there. And certainly on this continent, it can be an issue. So for 45 seconds uh, to, to pause to reflect on this, if you don't mind. So to share one example that I actually mentioned this morning during another presentation, uh, it may sound a little bit strange, but I, I find it very telling. There's a pedagogical counselor, which is actually my title as well, who worked to decolonize her program in a college. And the central thing that she found out is that the emphasis on time was uh, too restrictive. A lot of people, every student, uh, was coping with the fact that the program was too short. It was uh, labeled as a three-year program, and most people were doing it in four years. So the step that they took to decolonize the program was actually to label it as a four-year program, and it changed everything. And the part that's about colonization there is that that timing who cares about that timing? It's, you know, the view, the perception of time varies across the world. And that's a very colonial <laughs> uh, position on timing that needs to be done by that date. So to decolonize the mind sometimes can go with things that are fairly simple, like just a slight change in policy. It required a lot of work, but just to do that for to the program was actually an, an example that I found interesting. I'll also share an example, but I also encourage folks if they um, if they want to to share some of these reflection responses in the chat if, if you're comfortable, of course. So in open education specifically, um, you know the the idea of decolonization certainly has a role. And as an ethic that's core to open education is one of liberation from dominant ideologies. In Canada, we had something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and out of that came 94 calls of action. And some of these calls of action were specifically targeted at institutions of higher education. So call 62 specifically says, provide the necessary funding to post-secondary institutions to educate teachers on how to integrate indigenous knowledge and teaching methods into classrooms. We need to ask ourselves how the OER that we publish is perhaps responding to this call. And while I'm talking about a concept in a, in a very specific Canadian context, there are communities where all of us live that have done the work, uh, work that perhaps shouldn't be their burden to tell others how they want us to respond to them. So just seeking out that information and then working towards it um, I think would be incredibly helpful. And it would also 
be worth, worthwhile for instructors to develop renewable assignments, something we'll talk about that might take on some of the calls of action that we have here in aiding our institutions, including higher ed, um, to sort of fulfill these, these calls to action. So this session came together because Rouge and I were having very involved and deep discussions about a lot of things that happen behind open education. We've been working at it for a number of years, and some people talk about it as though it were completely new, but some of the, us have been involved in it in such a deep way for such a long time that it can be a little bit uh, jarring to be told things by people who are coming in, who are taking it with their own personal values outside of the, the core values that concern people. So part of it, even the title uh, of people, programs, and personalities came from uh, a, a framework that uh, Rouge put together very quickly during those discussions. So I think there, there, there's something really telling about that collaboration that we're having over the past several months uh, that can lead to different things, including this session, because it you know, open education is about something that is collaborative. Uh, so first, in terms of a roadmap, we'll briefly share a bit about this field that we've both worked in open education, and then ground open education in the context of other social movements and bring to the fore that there are values that underpin the work that we do that is very much borrowed from other movements and that has found a home in open education. Then we'll attempt to define a problem, the, a problem as we see it, um, and share a few examples of some of these inconsistencies that we've noticed with the maturation of this movement. And by being critical, our hope is to be generative um, and not critical for the sake of being critical. And finally, we want to make that contribution to offer a constructive way to identify risk and plan library-led social um, justice-oriented programs by sharing this criteria that we found really useful in evaluating projects as they mature. Okay, so this illustration on my screen, on our screen, is so, um, is so potent because whether or not it's warranted, navigating copyright can be anxiety-inducing, and it makes folks feel like they're going to do something wrong or they have done something wrong, and what open education offers is perhaps an alternative to that, right? So the European Commission defines open education as the way of carrying out education where the aim is to widen access and participation to everyone by removing barriers and making learning accessible, abundant, and customizable for all. Popular approaches to open education can be seen through the use and creation and adaptation of open educational resources and also open pedagogy. Open educational resources are commonly referred to by their acronym OER, and they are freely available and adaptable teaching and learning resources that can include textbooks, class assignments, syllabi, and much more. This is enabled, of course, by the open licenses. Um, and the, the, you know, the power of the open license is that it allows for copyright holders to share their work to a public knowledge commons. This idea of collaboration, sharing, and community building is also what underpinned the, um, the idea of open pedagogy. One of the most popular manifestations of open pedagogy is that of the renewable assignment. I find a really helpful tactic in talking to folks about what open pedagogy is and what a renewable assignment is, is to actually talk about what, are, what is not a renewable assignment, so the disposable assignment. And Wiley and uh, Hilton share that uh, a disposable assignments are those that both faculty and students understand will ultimately be thrown away. Essays are perhaps a good example of these assignments. Um, you know, frequently students will write these essays, faculty will grade them, provide feedback, but then nobody looks at it again. They're thrown in the recycling bin or in the trash can of a computer. Um, whereas the renewable assignments are forms of assessments that center students as creators of information rather than simply consumers of it. It's a form of learning where students demonstrate understanding through the act of creation, but the artifacts of creation are perhaps used, uh, are licensed openly and used 
in the community. So they go, they flow back into the community rather than sort of stopping with that grade that's received and then nobody ever looks at the, at the paper again. So think about instead how some faculty, excuse me, have moved toward having students edit or create Wikipedia assignments so that others can use, build upon, and access the work that they've done rather than working in a closed environment. And I just rushed through everything in, not everything at all by any means, but um, some highlights of the open education landscape, um, just in case folks were less comfortable in the landscape. So the open, educa open education is an educational movement founded on openness with connections to other educational movements such as critical pedagogy and with an educational stance which favors widening participation and inclusiveness in society. And that's why a conversation about values is so valuable here. So values are at the core of our work as open education practitioners. Values in a particular orientation are what brought me to the open education movement as a student in Montreal. The outrage that I felt when the government was proposing tuition hikes is very similar to what I feel when we privilege closed access publications and when I see corporate interests like publishers driving our curriculum. That being said, you know, there are also risks associated with our work in, in our open practice. Um, but before we get into that, I will turn it to Alex to speak about values as well. Yeah, uh, so in terms of values, in fact, uh, one way to put it is that I'm not an activist. Uh, I've had a lot of students who are, and I've worked in community organizations and things like that, where people are activists, and, and I can defend that, like it's their right to be activists, but I tend to support other people's projects. That's kind of my work as a pedagogue, but also like basically in open education, it's about that. It's not about deciding what others should do. My core value here is to allow action by others, even if I disagree with them. And in some ways, especially if I disagree with them. And I find that there are limits to what we can do together about this. Like that's part of the limits there. So we are critical in some ways. And uh, the there's a lot of talk in the open education movement about the licenses uh, for open educational resources, specifically. Open textbooks are a core part of open education. There's a lot of initiatives and I value them a lot. I think they're tremendous. There's a lot of efforts that are done there that are that is extremely important. At the same time, we know that it goes beyond that because it's not the only tool we can use to achieve the goals that match our values. And uh, part of the quote that we keep going back to uh, that is actually spelled out in different texts, but certainly Robin De Rosa has said it specifically, that Open is not a panacea. <laughs> if we keep going back to this, like it's not a magic bullet, it's not the perfect solution. So the focus is really on the connections that we make. And it's between disciplines and it's rooted in our traditions in critical education. Critical education goes way back. You know, we can go back to Montessori, Paulo Freire. Uh, my father was actually studying with Jean Piaget in Geneva, we, who's kind of the father of mo modern pedagogy in French, uh, at least, and uh, or bell hooks. Uh, there's a lot that happens with that movement that is much broader than open educational resources, OERs, it's much deeper and it's much richer. Uh, Erwin already mentioned the renewable assignments. It's much richer than just accessing a resource. I know that access is important and it can be rich in itself, but there's something very deep as to, about going beyond that, you know, deeper in, uh, uh, in the roots that we have. The, the roots make us grow as a movement and the leaves also help like in terms of, you know, getting the, the, the resources that we get from the sun and, and, and the rain for a tree. So it's exactly that kind of a uh, thing. And our work runs parallel parallel with OA, open access, right? You're, probably some of you are working on this at your, your library. And the research literature itself, it's very important to access it. And in that case, we don't want the articles themselves to be adaptable. 
necessarily. Like we want to provide access, that's very important. But for open education, it goes, goes much deeper that the resources, when they're resources, need not only to be accessed, but also to be adaptive and adaptable. So there's a whole landscape of open, uh, which gives us value as uh, learning and research professionals uh, as a network. So one of the articles that, uh, that we found inspiring was talking about the promises of open educational resources in general, which is a core feature of the movement, and that some of those are false promises. Uh, the key point, which is in a way very simple, it's spelled out in the title, like we run the risk of you know, condemning those initiatives if we don't practice open pedagogy. If you do very close pedagogy with open resources, it's not only you know, a compromise, it's also something that will make it uh, wither <laughs> and possibly die because then you, know, you can't sustain them uh, in the long run. Speaking of risks, this is another really good piece by Nicola Wachter that warns um, about the sort of the corporate interests like commercial publishers and how they're turning to new business models. And of course, new business models include the practice of extracting and selling data. This piece warns that OER platforms are not immune. So one really potent quote reads, a lot of educational and technological infrastructure risks reducing teachers, students, and their interactions to measurable data sets that increasingly shape educational processes through standardization, competition, they prepare the grounds for data monetization business models in education. So the author urges folks to be aware and sort of come up with the criteria to assess platforms and technologies to ensure that the open movement is guided by educational rather than economic interests and are aligned with values of sort of education stakeholders and the OER movement and not perhaps other, other interests. And um, in a sense, and um, sorry, in a sense, um, what the author is cautioning against is this idea of open washing. So a term to basically describe this phenomena of something presenting itself as open when it's not actually open. So in the context of open washing, open refers to the idea that Platforms should be transparent, accessible, information should sort of um, be made available, part of, it should in, increase participation and um, access to information and knowledge sharing. Whereas some resources that claim to be open or platforms, I should say, aren't necessarily meeting that criteria. And so here we enter the problem as we see it. We've sort of shared some of these critical pieces that have come out. Uh, but we want to sort of frame it around a succinct, um, a succinct problem, recognizing that it's much more complex, but for the purpose of this presentation, at least. Libraries are politicized spaces. They're ca caught in the system where corporate interests drive decision making. That being said, libraries and librarians do some really good work. So, for example, coming up with remedies to issues like the exorbitant costs of textbooks through programming in open education. But like most things, you know, nobody gets anything right the first try, at least that's not common way things work. Yet that there, there is this mythology around library work that can be detrimental to the work that we're actually trying to do. An academic librarian, Fobazi Etra, coined the term vocational aunt to describe the set of ideas, values, and assumptions librarians have about themselves and the profession that result in notions that libraries are institution, as institutions are inherently good, sacred, and therefore beyond critique. And in this 2018 piece, the author attempts to flesh out this phenomenon to describe its effects on library philosophies and practices so that they might be recognized and deconstructed. Vocational awe demonstrates some of the insularity in our thinking and speaking about libraries. And it's important, um, it's why it's so important to connect what we do in libraries with other cultural moments that are happening around us. And perhaps that's through values, um, through other social movements, 
so um, with the with you know this movement maturing, it becomes imperative to make these values the ones that are perhaps at the margins more explicit. So there's definitely a temptation to solve problems with proprietary solutions or non-open values. Um, and this is something if you haven't already faced, you will, right? So the idea of inclusive access as a solution, right? So there's a, a lot of pushback um, and actors at play in this, in this world that we have to, it feels like a, we have to actively resist it. This is a this is exactly what not to do with a slide, I know, but this quote is too good not to read aloud, so I'm going to read it aloud. Um, the open at the margins anthology opens with this bell hook quote. Marginality is much more than a site of deprivation. In fact, it is also the site of radical possibility, a space of resistance. It was this marginality as a central location for the production of a counter hegemonic discourse that is not just found in words, but in habits of being and the way one lives. As such, I, Sabel Hooks, was not speaking of a marginality one wishes to lose, to give up or to surrender as part of moving to the center, but rather as a site that one stays in, clings to even because it nourishes one's capacity to resist. It offers to one the possibility of radical perspectives from which to see, create, imagine alternatives, new worlds. So here, Bell Hooks is framing the margins, which is really where open education began at the margins of these conversations around accessibility and higher ed. But at, as the margin is a desirable place to be, and sometimes as you move to the center, which is not always a bad thing at all, but referring back to the values that were held at the margins is a really important act. At the 2020 Open Ed Conference, Karen um, Tangielosi and Tanya Elias led a participatory session where participants made public and intentional declarations of their views, motives, and intentions in the form of a manifesto. This document is significant because it decenters programs and practices that we oftentimes focus on in libraries, but turns it, its attention again to the people that those programs excuse me, and practices hope to address. Um, the Google document is still accessible on the web and I encourage folks to check it out. It really does a great job of demonstrating linkages between open education and other social movements. And um, the manifesto concept itself really highlights values as core to open, which allows us to see similarities and opportunities for solidarity and uh, productive challenges within and, uh, and with others in the open ed movement. So it's time for another reflection as we did before. And again, feel free to keep it to yourself, but you can obviously uh, share in the chat uh, if you want uh, afterwards. So in this case, it's uh, about the values or the value if there is a single one which brought you to do work in libraries. So thank you for doing this. And uh, I would encourage you to keep those thoughts and doodles uh, and what you and when you have a moment, maybe you can revisit that uh, with earlier parts of your strategic plan or other things that you, you were envisioning. So now we want to talk a little bit and we're careful here, obviously, uh, but to, to frame some risks, uh, raising some flags that are not red flags per se, but at least orange flags, that there are some limits to open education. We love open education. We think it can really be a tool uh, for to accomplish a lot in terms 
in terms of things that align with our values, but obviously there are still some risks at stake. So I'm going to, we have a few different examples of how some of these risks manifest. And so we're going to go through some of them. I'm going to start by talking about statistics, numbers, and the metrics of success. In higher education and in libraries, there remains a focus on quantifying outcomes. At the same time, open education and even some universities are increasingly focusing their missions on decolonization. And to me, Data is a part of that conversation. We have to rethink the logics of reducing our evaluative criteria to numbers. Specifically, quantitative data doesn't explain why a particular phenomenon is being captured. And the work doesn't end with collecting, organizing, and making data publicly available. Folks still have to interpret that data effectively. Um, and this can be a challenge, especially in an economy that's increasingly driven and to see data as a commodity. So specifically, Amy Collier um, sort of identifies this risk in, in um, the way that platforms we use in education um, can sort of be brought to the fore. And so Collier says, platform capitalism inevitably led to a disembodying of student and teacher and a tendency for the university to move away from their role as nurturers of student learning and growth and guardians of knowledge toward a position where students and teachers were seen within the data gathered around them as crops to be harvested. In open education, this manifests in a few particular specific ways. Um, you know, I myself have been involved in these projects to create dashboards to illustrate the success and the growth of open educational programming. And you know, these dashboards often report on student success metrics like grades and retentions. I wanna talk about four specific things here. So the first one is perhaps the most simple critique, but the sort of drain on my time working on these projects. You know, I could not help but feel that my expertise could have perhaps been used to serve the people that we were meant to serve more effectively um, than you know, being bogged down in sort of creating, organizing, and showing that what we were doing um, was being growth. Some of the metrics, so as a second point, some of the metrics that we use to illustri illustrate success of these open educational programs end up relying on values that don't actually align at all with open education, right? So for example, these student outcome indicators that I already referred to, like the average, let's say, of a grade earned in a course that's zero textbook cost. So perhaps that's using OER versus a traditional course, comparing grades to see, okay, who had the better outcome, right? At the same time though, you know, using grades as a measure of success for student outcomes has been something folks in you know, critical uh, studies have really long challenged. And it's very similar to the critique of say journal impact factors, right? Yet we've fallen back on relying on the very metrics open education sought to problematize in a way. Third, so there are two um, anthropologists, Belstorff and Moore, I hope I'm saying their names wrong. I've never heard them said, um, only benefited from their work, but they explain that data is formed through relations that extend beyond data itself. What counts as data and data's referent is a social process with political overtones, and data is always in real-time transformation in ways that cut across notions of nature and culture. This is really important as we're sort of in the thick of the data-driven era, right? We're just not as attuned to the social life of data and the associated risks. And I know that I'm saying things that may, I'm maybe not making the most amount of sense. So I'm gonna use sort of an example to ground this. Um, by making data sets public, let's say around open programming at your institution and how much it's grown and how much money is saved and which courses are, you know, uh, and departments are doing best in this realm. What we're not thinking about is that, um, we opened up this data, but we also have invited more perhaps fiscally minded actors to consider how they might be able to capitalize on that data, right? Even if it's anonymized to a certain degree. Um, 
And that's not to say that we should stop collecting data altogether, of course, but it is about recognizing the limitations and potential risks with the collection of data and making that data publicly available. Finally, David Wiley in his recent, so August 2022, for me that's still recent, um, reflects on this in, in his own work around data and OER. And he ultimately challenges some of his own previous reliance on metrics to assess open education. And a lot of what the piece focuses on is the fact that open education is actually woefully under theorized. Wiley pivots and says, I'm simply going to suggest that neither open licenses nor cost savings nor increased access to materials are responsible for those differences in student success. He suggests it's in fact, um, I think, so Wiley thinks, that a reasonable person would hypothesize that faculty who are better supported would be more effective teachers than faculty who are less supported. So this article recenters the practitioner, so the people as the difference makers and not so much the programs. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, taking teachers uh, being supported in consideration coming from someone who was really advocating for open content, his site is actually open content, is very significant. And a lot of it, when you talk about support, we think a lot about financials. And obviously, the open education movement, a large part of it is about saving money. There, and, and we understand why we were not against it, but it's true that uh, even in terms of data, like some sites that propose open educational resources will display uh, front and center the amount of money that is being saved. The point is uh, that that students do struggle financially in many parts of the world, including many parts of the US. Uh, certainly inequalities are a big part of the, the, the story. And the problem there is that it's not just about the content. They struggle also in terms of housing, in terms of tuition fees in some cases. Like I work in a system where it's tuition free. Uh, it's completely possible to do a full degree without spending a dime on tuition. Obviously, there are other costs. So thinking about the limits of open education is also about thinking of the limits of even financially, it's not enough. It's, it can't cover the whole in terms of financial needs. And uh, uh, in terms of credentialism, which is something that has been theorized in social sciences for decades upon decades, but is certainly becoming a very strong tendency is that people go to universities and colleges to get a degree, and sometimes they don't even know why a degree is useful. It, it's not diploma mills. But it's still the idea that you get a degree and are you really getting an education? Are you learning? So uh, in, as, a, as a teacher, something that I, I came up with, I came across a lot is a sense of entitlement. People, especially wealthy students who are also very good at getting high grades, We'll, we'll talk about their, their being entitled to high grades. And it's a little bit like, uh, you know, subscribing to a gym and not doing the exercise. I think there's a lot of that that happens when we think of the degree as a commodity. Uh, and it's not even just about the prestige, but it can go through that. And even in open education, there's been the MOOC moment. Uh, like in 2012, it was called the year of the MOOC. So the massive open online course. It is about openness in some ways, but it was co-opting part of the movement. So it's a limit of open education there that was like, oh, the content is free, but you need to pay to get the literal credentials. That was a model that was used by a number of those. Uh, thanks for this, yeah. Uh, so uh, specifically focusing on credentials can you know, make that limit very prominent uh, for us. And sustainability in digital spaces is something that I think as far as open education, as, as far as the conversations I've been privy to is something also that's uh, you know, in its, in its um, early stages. It's really easy to detach our focus on creation in digital spaces from environmental impact because we have this sort of vocabulary to talk about the cloud as something that's not grounded, that's not physical, um, but really, you know, 
very much has a physical form, right? It takes away our focus from physical environmental impacts of creation without limits. Data is being stored in physical spaces. And I encountered this in a very real way when managing a OER publishing program, you know, we oftentimes had to go to our hosting service and ask for more space because there was so much creation happening. Not all of this creation was being shared by any means. A lot of it was, I'm sure as librarians have experienced lots of test books, things that were started, but then abandoned. Um, and there's just a lot of focus on create, 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 right? And I want to sort of pull forth, you know, what would it look like to take the focus away from creation to some of the other core values of librarianship, like accessibility, discoverability, and usability? So we, in the OER world, we talk a lot about adaptation, that we, we provide resources that can be adapted. I mentioned that earlier. And there's a pivot there that, comes from going from creation of new resources like we need new resources more resources more resources we need more resources we think less about usage i i tend to say if a, an open educational resource falls in the forest and nobody is there to use it is it really an oer and i think it's not so there's a pivot there through adaptation if we think about resources in French, like I'm a Franc francophone, uh, and we work a lot like people in Europe that will send open education resources, like open textbooks, whatever it is, to North Africa. But then do they pay attention to the fact that there's a, a wealth of scholarship that comes from the Arabic world. <laughs> Arabic scholars have contributed so much. In fact, their enlightenment itself was facilitated a lot by uh, Arabic scholars at the time. So translating resources from French to Arabic, which is something that is done a lot, is also an adaptation of the mindset, the knowledge behind it. Uh, so just to, to get you to think about that a little bit. And then uh, another reflection that I uh, want to have is uh, the type of question that I like a lot, the how might we question, is the how might we work together to achieve epistemic justice, which goes beyond status and ego. So for 45 seconds, thinking about how can we contribute to this? How might we work together? So now we can uh, present the framework we're using to achieve these things. Okay, so this brings us to our framework for evaluating library-led justice-oriented work. And that is that people should inform the programs and the programs should depend on the personalities or experts to sort of follow them to fruition. Um, so people, then programs, then personalities, seems very simple, but it's really effective. And we'll give specific examples about how sort of reordering things might offer um, some remedies to issues that and risks that we're seeing. So some of the, uh, the you know, the above risks that we spoke about um, can be attributed to these things falling a bit out of order. So for example, when I spoke about data, we often make decisions to advocate for programs, right? Showing, making those data sets and those dashboards saying our program is working, but we lose sight of the people that the programs were helped to serve in sort of the, the advocacy around keeping the program itself alive. And uh, in, in terms of uh, people, basically that people are driving those uh, programs. So if we think about the financial savings, well, thinking about thriving, 
financially. Applying the framework to people is that it's about people first. It's not about the program itself. The program would be meaningless without people. And uh, to quote uh, Robin De Rosa, like students can't contribute if they don't thrive, if they don't thrive, they, they can't survive. So it goes all the way back to that. So for programs, right? Programs must remain, um, sort of retain their focus on, on the people. Um, and the way that a program is run is as important as why that program is run, right? So there are labor considerations. Some of us do things off the side of our desk, um, on sort of unpaid over time. Um, and then I think about granting programs too, right? So there's this sort of, there was this interest in setting up granting programs to give out modest grants to faculty to perhaps author some of these OER. And as somebody who facilitated one of these programs, time and time again, I saw that time sometimes was more valuable than the modest sort of financial compensation we were able to give folks. You know, at a different institution, I saw that precarious faculty were more likely to apply because they were you know, having to depend on these granting opportunities to supplement their income, for example. And I was also noticing that grants that were at a lower dollar value, the projects sort of uh, supported by the grants were not being completed. You know, um, so something that I advocated for was giving out fewer, more significant uh, grants. So a higher dollar value grant. So that means funding less projects. and the ZTC program. So, you know, um, we talked about zero textbook cost programs briefly. So these are those that encourage the use of lower no cost educational materials. These programs are increasingly being used to attract students to particular, to particular institutions. Here we see programs and big name institutions as, as personalities being privileged over people. So by using these programs as a recruitment tactic, we often reduce students to being commodities, right? We're all vying for students in a really um, competitive marketplace. So instead, what would it look like to focus back on the student, back on the people? More focus perhaps on making ZTC information available to students in a course catalog, um, so that they can sort of make um, choices about what courses to take based on what income allows and doesn't allow, rather than using it sort of to attract students to an institution, but not doing the work to connect the students with the program. And in a way, when we talk about personalities, it does matter, right? Uh, with, within those programs, personalities do matter sometimes they can get in the way and i think the 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 basis of it is about humility in some ways to be uh, willing to learn and one in terms of credentialism i think it, it's literally about personalities in some ways uh, i'm thinking about those celebrities who got their children into college based on their own personalities right because they're known and when we see Open education, uh, it's, you know, about going beyond the prestige of the, the that specific university. I know that some of you come from very specific, uh, prestigious universities, but it can go so much broader than this. And thinking about, uh, it, it's an interesting example these days with Twitter. If we think about uh, the current owner's personality, which drives everything. So if you were to think that Education, including open education, like Elon Musk himself, is very much into open all sorts of things, uh, including open sourcing, uh, some of the code and all of that. But imagine if Elon Musk were to dominate the whole sphere of education. It could be more open, but in terms of personality, we can't say that he's humble, right? There's a problem there. It's becoming clear that uh, it's not the right place to, to do these things. And it's certainly not the, uh, um, the mode in which we can do these things. So that basically wraps it up. And I'm sure there, there's been a few comments, including about ungrading and about uh, the customer-based approach to uh, education. Uh, but feel free also to uh, to talk about uh, some of those other things. I think.
the int intention there was not to talk at you, but obviously uh, we hope that you, you were able to think through some of those issues. And I'm sure you have things to share if you, if you want. Including questions. No problem, our pleasure. And have some of you been involved in programs uh, uh, in OER and such? So to buy into the framework when it's already a struggle to get them uh, to consider OER at all, I, I, I appreciate the question. And I think the way there is in fact to consider open education as itself an approach, as a tool to accomplish something. So this thing about values, when you want them to consider OER, great, to do what? It's a tool to do what? Open is not a synonym for good. Uh, and it can be, a, you know, it, it can be about making something effective. So maybe a, a, an approach there would be to talk about the people first that you're centered on learners who are trying to accomplish something and how does open education achieve that goal? And then you can implement OERs as uh, a part of that tool. The approach is more important than the tool and more important than the approach is the fact that we want to achieve something with people. Yeah. I also wonder, you know, sometimes we're told we need numbers to convince people. Um, but maybe we are now we've entered sort of this cultural moment where we don't need to really do that anymore. And maybe perhaps what's more convincing um, is our values to connect what's happening in libraries and open education with the struggles that people are facing just generally in their teaching or in life. Um, I don't think it's bad to move away from perhaps the dashboards that show the money savings and yeah. uh, improvements yeah, yeah. in grades, but to talk about shared values yeah. across our um, our work. And on uh, copyright, uh, it it's a huge part of OER. Uh, so. Uh, for instance, I'm certified uh, with Creative Commons. So the, the organization Creative Commons itself does uh, even a bootcamp version. That's what we did for a full year, uh, full week, sorry. Uh, 40 of us uh, were trained in Creative Commons. And it's really about copyright, understanding what copyright stands for. So OERs are typically using those open licenses, uh, Creative Commons specifically, which come from the US and can be a challenge internationally, but they have uh, met that challenge. It's meant to be used everywhere, uh, anywhere. Uh, the, the same uh, permissions apply anywhere. It's not just for classroom rules, but there are things, and in fact, not just classroom, but also traditional knowledge. There are so-called TK labels, traditional knowledge labels to say, we want to open it up that you can use it in certain environments, but not others. So that's part of the copyright issue is that there are some things where we want to keep the copyright restrictions, but we allow certain things to happen in certain contexts and that can be allowed. So there's a whole discussion uh, around this. Uh, we don't, don't need to get into the details, but it is certainly a huge part of the discussion uh, with the OER is that it's about licenses, but about the way we apply the licenses and sometimes give permission above and beyond the licenses to say, overall, I don't want you to use it commercially, but as the copyright holder, I'm allowed, allowing you to use it in this specific context and things like that. Yeah, Rose? Um, the question about how copyright enters the discussion. I think it's helpful to, again, go back to some of the, the issues that are faced by faculty. You know, um, I'm almost hesitant to refer to the pandemic since, you know, it's been done. But, um, you know, think about the problems specifically that were faced in that moment of intensity. It's not as if the, you know, access to books in the online environment or resources, the new thing, but it was certainly made more um, 
more of an issue during the pandemic. So referring to like real life, you know, real ways where faculty and their students' lives were were challenged by by the way we think about um, the sharing of knowledge might be a way where copyright can enter the conversation. Absolutely, and uh, it's almost a segue into the credits, the fact that we are using some, some content from Slides Carnival and from Unsplash. The point about copyright and the specific point about Creative Commons is about attribution, right? It's the basic thing that we need to at least attribute. And that's exactly a point about open education that it's not just about opening access, it's also about making sure that we trace where knowledge comes from and that we acknowledge this in our work. I think it's pretty important to do. So I don't know if there are other questions and uh, comments and anything like that for the next minute left. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you Alex and Arouge for this great presentation. I hope you guys, everyone has a great rest of their day. <laughs>